Welcome to this Jeremy Bamber and White House Farm podcast. In this episode, we explore the evidence which has been discovered during years of research revealing that Sheila Kafal had only suffered a single gunshot injury when senior police officers saw her at the scene. This issue is important as people question to this day how Sheila could have shot herself twice, even though the pathologist said he'd seen other cases of suicide with multiple shots. The pathologist, Dr. Venesis, who conducted the post-mortem on the evening of the 7th of August 1985, stated that although it was uncommon for people to kill themselves by firing more than one shot, suicide with two shots does occur and was something he'd seen on previous occasions. However, for many people, this two shots factor proves that Jeremy Bamba murdered his sister and therefore was responsible for the shootings at White House Farm on the 7th of August 1985. In this episode, you'll hear police statements which fully support this argument that Sheila had only suffered one shot initially. While the evidence can sometimes be dismissed as ambiguous or open to interpretation, the testimony of senior police officers, including a commanding officer and an experienced police surgeon, are very difficult to explain as error, and each account supports the others. These testimonies Record Sheila as having only one shot to her neck when they saw her between 8.13am and approximately 9.15am. We also raise the question of why the scenes of crimes officers who arrived at the scene at 9.15am were prevented from entering the house for 45 minutes. Further evidence indicates that something happened between the raid and the photographing of the bodies by police photographer DC Bird. Whatever this event was, it's likely that it had something to do with the training exercises for firearms officers that were being carried out at the scene. Furthermore, photographs even suggest this training continued while SOCO officers were working. Whatever it was that caused Sheila to have an extra bullet wound, there is clearly significant non-disclosure of evidence regarding what happened inside the house between the raid team entering at at approximately 7.35am and 10am. Important issues of further concern are the number of weeks between the tragedy and the firearms team making their alleged first statements. This team also voiced concerns about the scene being disturbed between their raid and the photographs being taken. All of the factors discussed here help us to build a picture of what possibly happened during the police handling of the scene. Establishing the truth is further hindered by the non-disclosure of the complete coroner's report and repeated attempts for disclosure of the full version have been met with continued refusal. The evidence you'll hear today will highlight the importance of the investigation of this issue by the independent body, the Criminal Cases Review Commission, who have received this evidence as part of the new submissions. Newspaper reports published on the 9th and 10th of August 1985 carried articles which stated that Sheila had sustained a single wound. The East Anglian Daily Times carried a front page feature on the 9th of August 1985 which said Mrs Caffell was killed by a single gunshot from under the chin to her brain. Other tests confirmed she fired the weapon. These tests referred to, which were reported as confirming that Sheila fired the weapon, have never been disclosed to the defence. Are they in the files for the initial murder-suicide case under a unique reference number? A brand new investigation file with a different reference was opened on the 7th of September 1985 when Jeremy Bamba became a suspect. Much of the material contained in the original murder-suicide file has never been disclosed. Evidence starts at 8.13am on the morning of the 7th of August 1985. The scene had been officially declared safe and two senior police officers entered White House Farm. These were Chief Superintendent George Harris, the divisional commander, 
and Chief Inspector Terry Gibbons. Both were men of considerable experience who had attended many crime scenes in the past. They recorded in witness statements that they saw Sheila in the main bedroom and describe how she appeared. CSI Harris stated, A 2 2 rifle was lying along Mrs. Caffell's body, the barrel of which was resting just below an entry wound beneath her chin. Chief Inspector Gibbons recorded that he saw a younger female with a wound to her throat. Oddly, the first disclosed statements written by these officers are dated in mid-September 1985, weeks after the tragedies. This seems unlikely and we believe they made statements much earlier that were hidden in the murder-suicide case file. And these were undoubtedly even more detailed than the disclosed later statements. However, let us assume these really were their first statements, written in mid-September, and therefore it may be easy to conclude that these very senior and highly experienced officers were simply mistaken about the number of wounds they saw to Sheila's neck area. But this appears not to have been the case. At 8.25am, 10 minutes after Harris and Gibbons entered the house, they were joined by police surgeon Dr Ian Donaldson Craig. Dr Craig was a member of the Royal College of Surgeons and of the Royal College of Physicians and was the past president of the Police Surgeons Association with over 30 years of experience. Disclosure has been made of his witness statement dated the 7th of August 1985 in which he states he made the following observations of Sheila. There was what appeared to be an entry wound in her throat. He concluded his statement with the comment, The appearances suggested in the case of Sheila Bamba, the wound had been inflicted by her own hand. Oddly, this concluding sentence was crossed out in one disclosed version of this statement. In 1986, when he was interviewed for the Dickinson inquiry, Dr Craig even went further and informed Dickinson I only saw one gunshot wound at that stage. Dr Craig only saw Sheila in the main bedroom of the house and did not see her at any other time. Within an hour of Dr Craig's observation, Essex police officers, Detective Sergeant Stanley Brian Jones and Detective Inspector Robert Miller, officers of a substantial number of years' experience between them, entered the house together. D.I. Miller made a report the following week in which he stated the wound appeared to have been made by her own hand. D.S. Jones made no reference to any wounds in his witness statement in 1985. However, in 1991, he informed the City of London Police Inquiry that he'd accompanied the pathologist, Dr. Venesis, to White House Farm the following day 8th of August 1985, he stated that during this visit he'd been surprised when he was then told that Sheila had suffered two gunshot wounds. D.S. Jones told the City of London Police, up to that point I thought there had been only one. PC Norman Henry Wright had 22 years experience as a police officer and acted as the coroner's officer. PC Wright, along with D.I. Miller, provided information for the official coroner's report dated the 9th of August 1985, and this report states, The appearance suggested in the case of Sheila Caffell, the wound had been inflicted by her own hand. Therefore, a chief superintendent, a chief inspector, a detective inspector, a detective sergeant, a coroner's officer and a highly experienced police surgeon all testified that when they saw the body of Sheila in the main bedroom of White House Farm on the 7th of August 1985, before any photographs were taken, they observed that Sheila had only sustained a single gunshot wound. It's a fact that Detective Inspector Cook, Detective Constable Bird, Detective Sergeant Davidson and Detective Constable Henderson 
the four Sinza crimes officers who arrived at approximately 9.15am were prevented access to the house for 45 minutes and were only allowed in after 10am. So is there any evidence from the scenes of crimes officers that can throw some light on the wounds to Sheila? There's certainly conflicting evidence in the police statements regarding the position of the rifle on Sheila's body at various stages throughout the morning. This includes a senior officer who stated that when he saw Sheila, the gun was not on her body and evidence from D.I. Miller that it was by her side. The crime scene photographs also show that it was in different positions when it was on Sheila's body, all indicating that the rifle had featured in the training exercises. On the morning of the 7th of August 1985, Essex police photographer DC Bird was assigned to take the crime scene photographs. At approximately 10.20am, he began to take images of Sheila in the main bedroom of White House Farm. It is obvious that by that time, Sheila had two gunshot wounds to her throat area. As we said earlier, we now have the evidence from multiple sources, which proves that the rifle was being taken on and off Sheila's body before the time Essex police stated actually was. One crime scene photograph shows the rifle had been propped up in the window of the main bedroom well before 11.10am when it was, according to Essex police, removed from Sheila's body for the first time. The rifle was a semi-automatic and a magazine of bullets was attached, which means that whoever pressed the trigger, so long as there were bullets in the magazine, the rifle would fire. So we have to ask, did the rifle accidentally discharge when it was moved as part of the training exercises or when it was moved in order to make it safe? So let's go back to the time earlier that morning when PC Woodcock first forced entry to the house, smashing down the back door with a sledgehammer at approximately 7.35am. What did members of the firearms team that raided the house say in their statements about Sheila and how she appeared when they saw her? Well, they didn't make statements until weeks later and they were shown crime scene photographs to refresh her memories. This is documented in the post-trial report by Dickinson. These crime scene photographs do show Sheila with two gunshot wounds. Three members of the raid team made several mentions that the scene was not as they recalled and that Sheila was not in the same position as when they saw her. The only explanation is that the scene had been altered between the discovery of Sheila at 8.10am and the photographing of the scene, which began at 10am. If Sheila had one gunshot wound when the firearms officers found her, and when she was seen by senior officers, the coroner's officer and the doctor, but by 10am she had a second gunshot wound, then we can work out how this came about by using further supporting evidence. One hypothesis is that the second shot happened as the result of training exercises which were carried out in the house after the raid team had discovered the family were all deceased and declared the house was safe. The training exercises were conducted at the scene is set out in evidence from two sources. The first from an entry in a wireless message log from the scene which states GC11 to go to scene to assist with informatives. Training had been carried out at the scene and was also discussed in a post-Dickinson inquiry review of the police handling of the case. It is included in a report entitled X Lessons to be learned following the Dickinson inquiry 1986, which states, training men on the job do not assume capability. Is this in relation to many officers recording that Sheila had only a single gunshot wound when she was first seen, and that officers involved in training could not be held accountable for an accident during training. Jeremy Bamber also said, I recall that I was asked 
if the firearms team could carry out a rerun of the original raid on the house for teaching purposes. I simply agreed to this request. It must have seemed obvious to Essex police that I was not in a fit state emotionally to agree or not to such a request. Of course, Essex police should have, at the very least, waited until my family that had been taken to the mortuary before using the house for teaching purposes. We don't know the exact nature of these training exercises or how long they lasted, but it can now be shown eight further firearms officers arrived at the scene at 9am and each of them entered the house, therefore long after the house had been made safe by the raid team. These extra firearms officers can only have arrived for the purpose of training at a live crime scene. During an internal police inquiry in 1986, conducted by DCI Dickinson after the conclusion of the trial, he stated, The normal security of a murder scene was not maintained throughout the whole period as it should have been. So the question we must ask is, what if the officers who were in the house as part of the training exercises were practising moving the rifle from Sheila's body and the rifle went off accidentally, firing a second shot into Sheila's throat. This certainly would explain why only a single shot was originally seen and supports the fact that the second shot was delivered at an 80 degree angle to Sheila's neck. It's also consistent with a scenario that it was made by someone standing over her to take the rifle off of her body. Whatever happened to cause the second shot to Sheila, the detail of this has been withheld from the defence. And we believe this evidence is held in the undisclosed file from the murder-suicide investigation. We have the evidence that a substantial number of police officers and firearms officers attended the scene who have never been acknowledged by Essex Police, the Dickinson Inquiry, the C3 Department of the Home Office, the Crown Prosecution Service, the City of London Police and the Stoke and Church Inquiry. Many of these officers appear to have been whitewashed from the case. However, Essex Police never believed we would obtain the police investigation material we received in 2011 and it's from these documents that we have uncovered exactly what happened and who attended the scene. We can show that 62 police officers, 8 paramedics, a divisional commander from the ambulance service, a doctor, 2 undertakers, 2 builders and Jeremy Bamba were all present. Shockingly, an incredible 77 individuals attended the scene on the 7th of August 1985, of which 47 police officers and 5 civilians entered the house. The non-disclosure of case material, including a substantial number of crime scene photographs and witness statements made by police officers, some of whom Essex police have tried to obscure from the case, has impeded the defence in being able to establish a consistent chain of events throughout the morning. Officers who are now known to have attended the scene and to have entered the main bedroom were deliberately hidden from the defence and their existence has become known from references to them in documents such as fingerprint forms and major incident log entries. Many questions remain. Why did Essex Police attempt to hide the involvement of these officers? And why are there so many undisclosed crime scene photographs? Do these photographs show the faces of officers who were in attendance? Why were so many witness statements missing from the disclosed material? And even though the CPS are aware of the extent of non-disclosure and the importance of the issues which the missing material covers, the judicial review application about this, held in Leeds High Court in May 2020, still failed to achieve disclosure. The judge overseeing this judicial review application, incidentally, was the same judge who refused Jeremy Bamber's category review status.
withholding this information about Sheila having only one bullet wound when she was first seen, coupled with the non-disclosure of the full coroner's inquiry, allowed Essex Police and the Crown to hide this issue from the trial and the subsequent inquiries into the case. At trial, the issue of Sheila having been shot twice and the likelihood that she could have done this created doubt in the minds of the jury that Sheila had committed suicide. Nevertheless, this new material that we have discovered shows that when Sheila's body was first seen, she had only sustained a single gunshot wound. This evidence has enormous implications for the safety of Jeremy's conviction and makes up a small part of the submissions that have been presented to the Criminal Cases Review Commission. <laughs>